Well, as we finish up this series on the women in the Gospel of Luke, uh, I wish I could keep going on into the women in Acts, but I'm saving the book of Acts for next year. And although this morning is Pentecost, this isn't necessarily a Pentecost sermon. Again, we'll do Acts next year, and we'll begin next year on Pentecost going through Acts. Uh, So what I want to do this morning is not so much talk about Pentecost as I want to talk about the resurrection of the Son of God and how the testimony of the empty tomb and of the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ, first depended on the testimony of women. Women whom all of the gospel writers name for us to know and to trust. So who were these women? Well, look with me in the gospel of Luke. Look at verse 10 in chapter 24. In verse 10, it tells us who these women were. Luke wants you to know their names. In verse 10, it says it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James. And who else? Other women. Uh, We know that there's a lady named Salome who is there. We know uh, there are other women involved. But Luke wants you to know specifically these women's names. So who are these women and why are they important? What do they mean? Uh, Or do do they show up in the Gospel of Luke first here? Maybe that's another way of asking the question. Well, if you can, flip over in your Bible to Luke chapter 8. Because this is going to be an important passage for understanding who these women are. Because the author, Luke, uh, most likely Paul's physician, a doctor, Dr. Luke we might call him, wants us to know something about these unique women. In fact, this is not the first time that we learn about these women. If you were to flip over to Luke chapter 8, verses 1 through 3, you'll read these words. This is Luke chapter 8. So the same book, just earlier on in the Gospel of Luke, Luke tells us something about these women. Luke 8, verses 1 through 3 says this, Soon afterward, Jesus went on through cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's household manager, and Susanna, and many others who provided for them out of their means. Friends, did you catch that? Luke names women by name, and he introduces us to many of the women who are going to be at the empty tomb. Now, he introduces us to a woman named Susanna. Anyone named Susanna in the room? Are there any Susannas who can give me a Hosanna? Anybody? Nobody? Okay. Well, shot in the dark. Uh, This is the only verse that mentions Susanna. We don't know if she was at the empty tomb. But I do want you to focus on two specific women that he names in Luke 8, because they are going to show up at the empty tomb. The first woman we're introduced to is Mary Magdalene. And this is the most descriptive verse that we have into Mary Magdalene's life story. And what does Luke want you to know about Mary Magdalene? She had had seven demons in her life, and Jesus had cast out those seven demons. So you might say that she has somewhat of a sketchy past. Now, church history over the years has often wondered if she is the woman uh, who is the sinful woman of Luke 7, who is forgiven much and therefore loves much. Luke doesn't necessarily make that connection, but what we can say is that Mary Magdalene was a disciple of Jesus who was not necessarily proud of her past. For her, she had had a past filled with demonic possession and demons, and yet Jesus had miraculously healed her. Now, I want you to just, you know, take that life story And now I want you to compare it to another woman that Luke tells you about. And her name is Joanna. Any Joannas in the room? Oh, man. I need to start having some kids and using Bible names, y'all. Help me out. So if we have Mary Magdalene with this somewhat dark past, let's compare that to Joanna. Look in Luke chapter 8. What do we learn about Joanna? And this, is, this may be those moments where you think the Bible is boring, but actually it's just getting interesting. Look at verse 3. It says, what about Joanna? She was the wife of Chusa, who was what? He was Herod's household manager. You could translate that word guardian, financial advisor. Uh, it's epitropos in Greek. What it means is this is Herod's right-hand man that manages all of his finances. Who's in charge? You know, who's the chief of staff for Herod? Who knows all about Herod's wealth? It is this man, Chusa. He could say he is an insider. 
he has access to the most influential man in Israel, Herod, King Herod. So compare that now from Mary Magdalene, who has this sketchy past that she's not proud of, that she maybe doesn't want to talk about a whole lot because it's very traumatic. And then you have a woman who, who, who she eats dinner with the king half the time. I mean, could you imagine the kind of company that Herod's household manager used to keep, the backroom deals that Herod's, the king's uh, right-hand man, had to do? And Herod, after all, he's not necessarily a great guy. And yet, his, the household manager's wife is one of the women that follows Jesus around in his itinerant ministry. And even more so, Luke tells you and me that these are the women who are financing Jesus' ministry. Did you catch that? Look at Luke verses 8, verse 3. These are the women who provided for them out of their means. Now, means right there could mean not only that they actually physically make the meals, although that may not be true. What it primarily refers to is the financial support. This is an incredible statement for Luke. For us, it would seem like a throwaway sentence. But what Luke is letting you know profoundly, friends, is that Jesus really is for everybody. I know that can sound really, really basic, but friends, it is true. Jesus is for everybody. He is for women and men with traumatic experiences in their past, who are not proud of their past, and he is also amazingly people like Joanna, who are the ultimate insiders, who know the people, who know how to grease the squeaky wheel, right? They're the people who know what it means to glad hand. And yet Jesus calls people from every group to be born again, to be baptized, to put on Christ. And people's backgrounds do not matter. All who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Uh, friends, this is not just uh, me saying this. This is the gospel message. It is for everybody. Uh, think about how Paul talks about this in Galatians. This is one of my favorite passages. Listen to how Paul talks about the ministry of the kingdom of God. Paul writes, For as many of you were baptized into Christ, have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs, according to the promise Friends, this is an incredible promise that the gospel is for all people. Now, of course, when Paul says there's no male nor female, Jew nor Greek, he's not saying that there's no ethnic differences between people and that there's no gender differences between men and women. Those are distinct. What Paul is saying is that the call to be a full disciple of Jesus, to be a whole person, to become who you were meant to be, you've got to know Jesus. You've got to know your creator and be reconciled to him by faith. And I want to en encourage you to consider that even though all people are equal at the foot of the cross and all people are equal in the waters of baptism, that I want to suggest to you that there is still a distinction between men and women. In fact, I think I can prove it to you in this very passage. So go back to Luke 23, our opening passage. I want to try to prove to you that I think there is a distinction that God maintains between men and women. And you may, again, you may not think this, this matters in the passage, but I want to suggest to your consideration that it is. Uh, Paul, uh, nor Jesus, believes gender is simply a social construct. There are differences that complement each other, and they fully represent God's dignity. I mean, after all, God created the male and female in the image of God. That's literally the first page of the Bible. <laughs> now, let me show you this distinction at work. Some of you will have the eyes to see it. Some of you... Maybe not yet. Verse 55. This is chapter 23, verse 55. The women, right, that we know, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, the insiders, the outsiders, these women who had come with him from Galilee followed and saw the tomb and how Jesus' body was laid. Did you catch it? Verse 56. Then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. Right there in that passage, you just saw the distinction between men and women. Did you catch it? I'll read it again. See if you can catch it. The women who had come with Jesus from Galilee, the women who had been with Jesus since the beginning of the ministry, the women who had been with him since Luke chapter 8, and followed 
and they saw the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. Did you catch it? Some of you caught it. Because if you know the story of Jesus' death, who takes Jesus' body down from the cross? It's not the women. It's whom? Joseph of Arimathea. And Joseph of Arimathea in the Gospel of John, John 19, has a friend named Nicodemus. Maybe you've heard that name. Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea take Jesus' body down. And Nicodemus brings 75 pounds of spices and ointments to prepare Jesus' body for burial. And then Luke tells us that the women are watching Nicodemus and Joseph prepare Jesus' body. But if you, if you know the story of Jesus' death, he dies on Friday. What's happening the next day? Sabbath. And Sabbath begins actually on Friday night when the sun goes down and you can't work starting on Friday night. So what Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea do is they bring all the spices they can find and they sort of get Jesus' body ready for burial and then they put him in the tomb and the women are watching. And the women watch these men get the body ready. And they watch how they do it. And then the women go home and do what? Start working on a plan to fix what the men just did. <laughs> did you catch that? This is not a minor thing, y'all. The other Gospels, Mark, Mark tells us that the women watched where Jesus was buried, letting us know that when the empty tomb is there, they knew which tomb it was because they watched him get buried, right? But Luke says they watched how Nicodemus and Joseph prepared the body. You know, it reminds me of that old adage, if you want something done, ask a man to do it. If you want something done well, ask a woman to do it. You ever heard that? I'm being a bit facetious, but I do think this is true to the text. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus are hurrying on Friday evening to get Jesus' body ready. But the women know that Jesus is deserving of more. He's deserving of dignity and of respect. Where are the, where are the 11 apostles right now? Where are the 11 apostles right now? Who are, who are the ones thinking on Sabbath had prepared Jesus' body? You know, it's interesting when you think about this. If you go into chapter 24, we, we start to see that the women are the first ones to the empty tomb. And this really is a fascinating turn in the story of Jesus because what that means is that the reliability of the empty tomb hinges on the testimony of women. Uh, many of you may be familiar with uh, the fact that in this ancient world that the testimony of women didn't really matter for much. And so if men are concocting this story, if they're just making up a story, they would never say that the empty tomb, the first people who saw it were women. And the first people that saw Jesus back from the dead were the women. And it was Mary Magdalene who first talked to him. And also, they would never say that the 11 didn't believe. I mean, the 11 presumably are the ones telling you to believe them. Oh, but don't worry, I didn't believe it. I thought this was totally nuts. So you have to ask yourself, what would give someone this kind of honesty to say, <laughs> Yeah, I didn't even believe it myself. Yeah, the women were right. I mean, could you imagine a group of men saying that? The women were right? What gives somebody that kind of honesty and openness other than the truth itself? It's just so believable that it's, it blows your mind. It really did happen. The women were right. The tomb was empty. And it's incredible that this reliability hinges on women. And that should not be overlooked by you, friend, I, I do think this is an important thing to note because the testimony of women was often something that Christianity had to defend against people who didn't believe that Jesus rose from the dead. In fact, uh, there's an old church father named Origen. Uh, he lived in the uh, second century. And one of his main opponents was a guy named Celsus. And Celsus was a Greek philosopher, and he was a major opponent to early Christianity. Uh, early on, Celsus was saying why you shouldn't believe in the resurrection, and this was a quote from Celsus. Are you ready? Uh, Celsus, criticizing Christianity, said, After death, Jesus rose again and showed the marks of his punishment and how his hands had been pierced. But who saw this? A hysterical female who was deluded by the same sorcery. Origen has to defend this. St. Augustine defends this. It's ironic that in the ancient world, this would have made it seem less believable. But to us, in retroflection, we can see actually it makes it all the more believable. Also, I just want to suggest to you that Celsus never met my mom, who taught me on my wedding day, women don't get hysterical. That's offensive to say. They get historical. It took me several years to understand 
that enigmatic quote from my mom. So I guess what I want you to consider is this. The first people to see the empty tomb were these women. And Luke can name names. It's people like Mary Magdalene in all of her past. People like Joanna at all of those dinners that she had with all of those influential and important people. Is it any surprise then that the apostles, the 11, did you notice that in Luke 24, it's the 11? Did you notice that? It's the 11. Why is it the 11? Because by now Judas has betrayed Jesus. So it's the 11. And how do they respond? Well, Luke says that it, it all seemed like crazy talk. But he actually uses a medical term for the delirious speech that a sick person gives. And of course, you know, in our passage, Peter the de facto leader of the 11, wants to go investigate himself, and he goes and he marvels, but that doesn't mean he necessarily believes. It means more he's trying to wrap his mind around this. So what are we supposed to do with this story? How are we supposed to respond to this? Well, friends, I want to give you sort of uh, two, two quick responses to how you and I are supposed to respond. The first thing is I want you to try to place yourself in uh, right next to these women, okay? If you can use your mind's eye, use your divine imagination for just a second. Um, go with me. You, let's do a thought experiment. Imagine you're right next to these women, and you see the empty tomb. How are we supposed to respond, you and me? Well, the best way to do it is to look at the passage. It says, they're frightened. The two angels appear. Luke calls them angels later on in this chapter. He calls them men right here, but that's because they look like men. And the men, in verse 5, these angels, they say what? Why are you looking among the dead for the one that is alive? Friends, there are a whole lot of people today, even people listening to me today right now, that are looking for Jesus among the dead. They may think Jesus is a great philosopher. They may think he has some progressive things to say that they like. They may think he has some regressive things that they don't like. But at the end of the day, most people would say that Jesus is probably some kind of good prophet. But is he God incarnate? Is he back from the dead? Does his heart beat? Luke tells you that after the resurrection, he eats broiled fish. The resurrection of the Son of God is the turning point in history. Jesus is alive, physically and bodily, and he will never die. And if you are looking to find Jesus as some kind of moral teacher, but you want to withhold that he's God incarnate, you're missing everything that Jesus ever said. You're missing the whole point. What do the angels ask? Why are you trying to find the living among the dead? Uh, friends, you know, I love uh, the worship leader Bono. You may know him as the lead singer of U2. Uh, he has a lot of great quotes. Uh, Bono struggles with his faith. Uh, one of my favorite quotes that Bono has is, he says, Christians are hard to tolerate. I don't know how Jesus does it. <laughs> that resonates with me. But talking about the resurrection of the Son of God, Bono said this in an interview about his faith in Jesus. And I'm not endorsing everything Bono ever said or did but I do endorse this. I love what he says. He says, look, the secular response to the Christ story always goes like this. Jesus was a great prophet, obviously a very interesting guy, had a, had a lot to say along the lines of other great prophets, you know, Elijah, Muhammad, Buddha, Confucius, but actually Christ doesn't allow you that. He doesn't let you off that hook. Christ says, no, I'm not saying I'm a teacher. Don't call me teacher. I'm not saying I'm a prophet. I'm saying I'm the Messiah. I'm saying I am God incarnate. And people say, no, no, please just be a prophet. A prophet we can take. You're a bit eccentric. We've had John the Baptist eating locusts and wild honey. We can handle a prophet. But don't mention the Messiah word because, you know, if you do, we're going to have to crucify you. Friends, you cannot find Jesus among the dead. You have to have the eyes of faith to see him. That's the first thing. Second thing I want you to see from these women, if you were there, is notice what the angels tell the women to do. Um, who are these women? These are full disciples of Jesus. And what do disciples do? What do the angels tell them? Look at verse 6. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise again. Friends, what do the angels say to these women? <laughs> what are you talking about? You know the teachings of Jesus. You've been with him since the beginning. You've listened to all of his sermons. You know what Jesus says. Now just remember what he said and believe. Just remember. 
And what did the women do? Luke throws in one of the shortest verses in the Bible. Did you catch it? One of the shortest verses in the Bible. Do you see it? Look at verse 8. And they remembered his words. Friends, what do full disciples of Jesus do? They listen to the full words of Jesus, and they fully remember, and they obey. That's what it means to follow Christ. It means you don't listen to the world. You don't listen to the crowd. You don't listen to the people claiming to speak on behalf of God. You listen to God himself, Jesus, the word incarnate, the resurrected son of God. You remember his words and you believe. And you don't worry if no one else believes you. I mean, even the apostles don't believe at this point. Don't worry if everybody thinks you're crazy a little bit. These women didn't bother with that. And now we honor them for eternity because they believed and remembered the words. Uh, friends, what a great reminder as we get ready to partake of communion uh, that Jesus is alive, and that really is the turning point in history. And as we come to the communion table, uh, we are reminded to do this in what? Remembrance of his death on our behalf. Uh, friends, if you have been baptized in Christ, if you have put on Christ by faith, you are welcome at this table. This table is for you. This is a holy time. This is a time to reflect. This is a time to consider the resurrected Son of God. And friends, it's a time to remember the gospel. Let's pray as we prepare to take communion now. Father, we thank you for the testimony of these women. Lord, I praise you that you in your perfect plan saw fit to reveal yourself to Mary Magdalene and Joanna and to all the women on the way back. Lord, we praise you that you are alive. Lord, I ask you in the name of Jesus that each one of us would have a soft heart as we come to the communion table, that we would come hungry and thirsty for the words and the life of Jesus. Holy Spirit, I praise you that you have come to be the interceder and the comforter. Lord, you know the things that are weighing on our hearts and minds. And Lord, we come before you needy. Father, would you set a time this part as holy? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.